last one's pretty straightforward, but architects are engineers. And I don't mean that literally because engineering is an entirely uh, separate field. But architects must be familiar enough with some basic engineering that they can design these stunning buildings to not only be beautiful but functional. And then, lastly, I'm going to you later on that give you a bit of Chicago history that will help you better understand why we have the architecture. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy this shoreline sightseeing architecture river cruise. And let's all be very thankful for that beautiful breeze that just hit the boat. It's really nice and hot there, I think. All right, it's going to be just a few moments before we make a right onto the main branch of the Chicago River before we can start talking about a lot of the buildings that you see. So until we get there, I want to start by pointing out this very exciting, super interesting pile of dirt covered in grass to the right. Now I'm pointing this out because this is called the staging ground. There are two new buildings that are going to be built on the other side of that bridge there, and they're using this something very cinematic about coming out from underneath that bridge, right? One of my favorite parts of the All right, now, of course, we will be talking about a lot of the buildings that you see up ahead when we get a little closer. So until we reach that point, I want to start off by talking about this massive building here to the left. It's got three towers at separate heights. That is one building that is not. It empties into the Mississippi River. But before 1900, this river actually flowed in the opposite no. direction, and it emptied into Lake Michigan. So how and why did the actually river change? Well, back when Chicago was first founded, like many cities in the country founded on rivers, it treated this river like its sewer. And I mean that in pretty much every single definition of the word sewer. So all of the human waste, all of the industrial waste, it was dumped into this river. And then the river was emptying into Lake Michigan, which was not only terrible for the environment and the wildlife of the lake, right? But, and I, I don't know whose bright idea this was, at the same time, the city was using Lake Michigan as their primary source of fresh drinking water, but maybe not so fresh. <laughs> so I don't really need to go into details about why that was super gross in the area that had to change. So starting in 1892, the Army Corps of Engineers dug a 28-mile channel out west to the Western River System, and like I said, they connected the Chicago River to the Mississippi River. They built up the foundation of the downtown, so they raised the foundation of these buildings. They dug that channel on a decline and essentially relied on gravity to change the direction of flow of the Chicago River. This was a pretty incredible feat of engineering that was replicated across the globe by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, on a few other different rivers. And it was uh, pretty important because it saved a lot of Chicagoans from dying of cholera, which of course was a very fatal illness, usually caused by contaminated drinking water. And let's be honest, that drinking water was pretty So, a pretty important bit of history for the Chicago River. All right, let's get back to some buildings. This light colored stone building up ahead on the right with the clock tower up top. This is a Chicago figment, the iconic Wrigley Building. If you've heard of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Gum, um, that's the same Wrigley. Now when I got this job, one of my friends got me a Lego set from Chicago Skyline. And the Wrigley Building was one of four buildings in that set, so that tells you how important it is to the city of Chicago. And this building was built in the early 1920s, and it was modeled specifically after a cathedral in Seville, Spain. So we call this style of architecture Spanish Revival style. Now, why was it modeled after Cathedral in Spain? It's the US after all, right? Well, because in the early 1920s, our architects here in the United States had not quite developed their own unique style yet. There was no major US style of architecture yet. So they were imitating the only styles that they were familiar with. And those were the grand styles of Europe. example of a style of construction that we're going to see a bit of on the river today called contextualism. I'm going to explain how this style of construction works. So, 
Do you see the three patios at different heights? You know, one here on the right, then up there on the left, then up Those are at really specific heights. So this first one here on the right is at the same height as the roof of the Wrigley building we just talked about. That one on the left, same height as the roof of that rock and shape looking building across the river. And then that one all the way up there on the right is at the same height as the roof of this black boxy building that you see from the view on the other side. And again, this is a style of construction known as contextualism. And it's all about honoring the environment or the context around the building, right? It's sort of an architect's way of giving little fist bumps or handshakes to the structures and the environment that surround their building, right? Through the context. Now, the guy who's listed as the lead architect on this building was a man by the name of Adrian Smith. And Adrian Smith, super important architect, is often referred to as the world's tallest architect, not because he's very tall, he's only 5'7", but because he's the guy who designed many of the world's tallest buildings. So, a bit of a cheeky nickname for Adrian Smith, the world's tallest architect. One of my absolute favorites here on the right, the iconic twin corn cob towers of Marina City. Now, Marina City was designed and built in the 1960s by architect Bertrand Goldberg. And Goldberg was really more of a social scientist, so he was really interested in how people live, more than where they live. So with Marina City, he was looking to design a fully self-contained city in the city as we live. So, here's how it works in Marina City. You're going to live upstairs, where unfortunately, you do have to furnish a high slash shaped apartment, which is a little then you're going to call your valet parked car. You're parked yacht, because who doesn't have a yacht? And you're going to live above a restaurant, a movie theater, a lonely alley, shops, and an office park. Yeah. And fully self-contained the city of the city. We like to refer to our the city as an introvert's dream world. All right, over to the left, you'll see the iconic Chicago River Walk. And you'll notice how it stretches all the way along the left side of the river here in the downtown area. This project has been transformative for the city. In fact, before the river walk, the closest you could get to the river was up there at street level and look down. But now you can literally sit on the edge of the river and you can actually dangle your feet over into the water if you want. But you'll often see that, particularly on this stretch right here. So again, really important for the city. It's really revitalized at the river's edge. All right, this building here with the white granite base and the reflective mirror glass. And if you look all the way to the top of that roof, it looks a bit like a Greek temple, maybe the Parthenon, right? This is a really good example of the neoclassical style of architecture. Now, neo is a prefix, of course, that means new, so you have new classical. The way this style works is you take key traits of classic architectural styles, like that temple roof, and you build it on a more modern-looking building with modern materials, and that's the neoclassical style. And this is what we call an umbrella term which means any style of architecture that you would consider classical from anywhere in the world can be part of a neoclassical building. So it doesn't, it's not limited to that Greek architecture style. Now the area of the city over to the left of that building is located, it has a nickname, it's called The Loop. And you might have heard that since you've been here. And it's called The Loop for a specific reason. Our public trains, which also have a nickname, they're called the L, which is short for elevated, as a lot of the tracks are raised above the ground. The L runs in a loop around the downtown city center. So there are six train lines that head from the north, west, and south side of the city, of the city, and they meet together in this downtown business center, so it's sort of circle. All right, Chicago honors its architectural heritage. This is important to know. There is a deep respect and appreciation for what came before. And I got a couple examples of what I mean more specifically by that coming up. This building here on the left, you'll see this black stripe of windows down. The section on the left of that stripe was built in 1927, but the section on the right was built in 1987, so 60 years apart. But you can see how the architect on the right honored the original intentions of the first architect, right? Although it is a little bit more modern looking, a little sleeker, a little updated, it's the same basic design, right? Same colors, same angles, same materials. Well, the Well Street Bridge we're about to pass under is another really good example of that. And that's because even though this bridge looks like all the other iconic Chicago-style bridges that are decades, if not about a century old, this one is only nine years old. And that's because it was designed as a replica, as a model to fit in with these other Chicago-style bridges, right? honoring that architectural heritage. All right, another one of my absolute favorites. 
the massive merchandise mark here on the right, the largest commercial building in the entire world. This building was finished in 1929, and it's the first example of the Art Deco style. And we're going to see more Art Deco buildings on the tour than any other style. Here are the key traits of the Art Deco style. First of all, you have deep inset windows, and those create vertical racing stripes intended to draw your eye towards the roof where the building narrows. It's covered in precision, repetitive patterns, finished with polished limestone and metal ornamentation. And again, this was the Art Deco style, incredibly popular in the second half of the 1920s, but very short-lived, so only in the second half of the 20s. And this was a style intended to express the optimism of the early 20s, right? Where people were looking forward to a machine-made future full of technology, airline travel, fancy cars. Of course, the stock market crashed that year, but we'll get to that later. All right, folks, we have reached Wolf Point, the trophy case of the Chicago River, where the three branches of the river come together. Also, when the sea first started back in the 1830s, just a couple of taverns and trading posts. This curved glass building here to the left, this is the new Bean Building from 1983. Another good example of contextualism. That's because the curve of the building matches the curve of the river. And the two rows of different colored reflective glass, the blue reflects the blue sky, and the green reflects the turquoise blue river. So again, it's about flattering the context surrounding the building. And fun fact about the new bean, this is where Ferris Bueller's dad worked in a little known <laughs> Chicago documentary with Ferris Bueller's dad. Alright, you see this building up ahead with the upside down U-shaped face and the red sculpture in front. This is stunning. River Point. Really an incredible building, some beautiful cool architecture here. But I only have a brief moment to talk about River Point. So when I point it out on my tour, I just like to let people know I think it looks like a Hot Pocket. Or maybe a McDonald's Cherry Pie Box. Yeah, you can debate which one you think it looks more like. I, I get hungry when I look at it. I should probably just have some lunch. But the reason why I only have a brief moment to talk about it is because I gotta get to talking about the oldest building that we're gonna see on the river today. And that's this peach-colored boxy building up ahead on the left side of the river. There's a lot to talk about here. This is the historic Fulton House. It was built all the way back in 1898 as a cold storage freezer building for the meat packing industry. Now, Chicago was the meat packing capital of the country for much of the 19th and 20th centuries, so there were a lot of these buildings here downtown back then, but this is one of the only ones left standing. And in 1971, the meatpacking business that operated in Fulton House left. They sold the building. And when the builders got inside to renovate it, it took them over three months to thaw the building out. And that's because they discovered four foot thick walls that were stuffed with matted horse hair and cork. Turns out that is an early version of insulation before styrofoam was invented. And apparently pretty effective form of insulation. Though I'm sure we can all agree we're happy they don't put horse hair in our walls. Now, in the 70s, there was a full gut rehab, an external renovation, the windows and the balconies were added, and it's now a very historic residential building, the Fulton House. Now, this raised bridge here to the right, this is the old Kinsey Street Railroad Bridge, and it was in operation until 2000 when it was retired. It is now a landmark here in the city, so it's permanently raised, but it's a really good example of the massive amount of counterweight you need to lift one of these structures in the air. So that big chunk of concrete on the right is called the counterweight, and that's what you need to lift the structure in the air and keep it raised. All right, folks, my personal favorite building on the tour is up here on the left, just past the Bolton House with the triangles on the roof. This is the River Cottages from 1988, designed by architect Harry Lease, and it's our only example of postmodern architecture we see on the river today. It kind of looks like something from Alice in Wonderland. Now, people thought that Harry Weiss, the designer of the River Cottages, was crazy for building a residential building on the north branch of the river in the 80s. That's the branch we're on right now. And that's because this branch in particular was still super gross. It smelled really bad, lots of trash, very polluted. People didn't want to be next to it. But because of architects like Harry Weiss, who built these residential buildings early on, the city's relationship with the river has dramatically shifted. And we have a really good example of that coming up on both sides of the table. We're going to start on the right. This massive building here is the East Bank Club. It's a high-end fitness center from 1980. And this is the back of the building, right? That's because this river, or this building, treated this polluted river back in 1980 like an alleyway. 
right? They didn't want people to gather out here, have to smell the river, look at but we also don't want it to smell too much because that would be really bad. So you have to find a happy medium, right? And so there are a few ways you can cut down on the sway of the river. And the system that 150 North Riverside used is called inertial slosh damper. That's an helpful On the top floor, there are 12 concrete tanks full of 160,000 gallons of water. How many you build a little chunk up? So say the wind hits the building on this side, right? Well, it's gonna sway over here. When it sways over here, the water in those tanks will slosh in the opposite direction, which brings it over here. Sways over here, sloshes in that direction, and so on and so forth. And that basically has an equal effect. It brings the building to rest much more quickly. So again, this is another one of those innovations that's really, really important for a skyscraper like 150 North Riverside. Right? Couldn't have been built 20 years ago. But now, it was able to be built, and it's got a pretty cool story. This is one of the few buildings that everyone almost uniformly remembers from the tour, because it's the building that looks like it's going to fall over. 150 North Riverside. All right, good question that we always get is how long does it take and how much does it cost to build a new building on the river these days? Well, perfect example here on the left. This is the Bank of America building. It's just finished within the past year. It took roughly three years to construct and cost about $800 million. Pretty standard for a building this size of order. And remember I said there was that zoning law that required a 30-foot setback from the river's edge? That's partly why 151 Riverside had that narrow base. This building dealt with that zoning law a little differently. It vaulted the third floor in the air with those tripod legs, created its setback, and also a little bit of plaza space for people to come outside and gather, see the signs on the river. All right, folks, I'm about to give you a short history lesson on the evolution of Chicago. We're going to be focusing on the next five minutes on the right. We're going to start in 1929 with this art deco building. I talked a bit about the 20s, right? When Art Deco was popular, this was the roaring 20s, the jazz age, a lot of excitement and optimism in the air. But as I said earlier, that year the stock market crashed. And that sent the United States into the Great Depression. This was the greatest economic downturn we've ever faced here in the US. So from about 1930 to 1957, there were basically no new office buildings built anywhere in the country. It was sort of an office building drought. But in the late 50s and 60s, architecture was rebooted after the country recovered from the depression with modern style buildings. And that is when a Chicago area architect by the name of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe showed up. And he introduced us to a style of modern building that we refer to as black box modernism. Pretty straightforward name for that style. Now, remember the people who were building and working in the 50s and 60s, they grew up through the depression. They didn't want to spend the money that they had to. They certainly didn't want to argue about how many gargoyles to build the roof, what kind of limestone to use. They wanted something simple and efficient, with no frills. And that's when Mies van der Rohe was like, hey, how about the simple elegance of a black box? And that's how they get black box modernism. Also known as Miesian style modernism after Mies van der Rohe himself. Now, Mies van der Rohe is arguably the most influential architect of the United States of the 20th century. And that's partially because he's the guy that invented the phrase, less is more, and believed that form follows function to philosophy in my view. And something that you'll notice about these large box buildings is that they often have a lot of trees around this, and that is in the future. These buildings are stark and dark, but really don't have much personality. So, the base was an opportunity to humanize the buildings, right? Put a little green space in and then create a plaza outside the together to it. So we made it through the 60s with modern style buildings like black box gardens. And that brings us to the 70s. With this white box up here on the right from 1971, an example of the international style of architecture. And this is a style very similar to black box, but it's lighter and brighter, right? Made with stone and concrete instead of that wise. Then the 80s shows up. And then in the 80s, we have hair bands, shoulder pads, turns. People were looking for something bigger, flashier, brighter, and worse. And that is when contextualism is born, right? Which we talked a bit about. But this 
building up ahead with the curved wall of reflective glass windows. That curve reflects the neighborhood, makes things look good. And that is contextualism. So there you have it. The Art Deco of the late 20s, we have that architectural drought of the Great Depression. Then modern style buildings like Las Vegas Modernism in the late 50s and 60s. Then we get the international style of the 70s and the contextualism of the 80s. So a bit of a history lesson on the evolution of Chicago architecture. I also really love to point out the irony of a bakery next to a fitness center. There's nothing architecturally interesting there. Obviously, it's a really part of the history of the church. The history of the time of the Good question. Someone asked, when I say the year of the building, was that when it was started, construction, or finished? And that's always when it was finished. Alright, this building here on the left, with this black box building, right? For a long time it was pretty standard, nothing special, but back in 2014 the owners really wanted to be special. So they spent over $800,000 to put themselves on the map by putting a map on themselves. So this is a two-scale map of the Chicago River. That red brick up there is basically the you are here, guys. Alright, if you have any Batman fans on the boat, you're going to love this next building. So I've got on the right this massive concrete building. This is the old main post office from 1921, it's 100 years old. But you might recognize it as Gotham City Bank from the beginning of 2008's The Dark Knight. So this is the building that the Joker and his henchmen robbed at the beginning of that film. They drove the bus out of that first floor on the street. Now, fun fact, my friend Brian is an actor and a stuntman based in Chicago, and he actually played the henchman in Sid Lyons, a group of the old main post office. Now, this character was immediately killed by Joker, so it was a very short lived appearance, but they had a great time filming the characters. When that movie was filmed, this building was empty. It had been abandoned since the early 90s, but it was purchased a few years later, and a lot of money was poured into renovating it. So, all in all, purchase plus renovations, we're talking over $900 million spent on the old main post office. Of course, it's pretty big, right? Which is why it was so expensive. But now it's home to many homes. Walgreens, PepsiCo, Chef Boomer, of course, among others. But my favorite fact about the old main post office is that the roof is currently home to a three and a half acre green space on the meadow. It's basically a small farm available for tenants and their guests. Fun fact about that statue the sculptor used for his model a West Side Barber's 14 year old daughter who later went on to become Miss Cook County. Pretty cool thing to think. Also, the Board of Trade has been Wayne Enterprises in a few of the earlier Batman movies. All right, back to the Queen itself. 311 South Blackwood Drive with barrels on top. Now, this building was finished in 1990. And originally at night, those barrels were lit up with over 1,800 fluorescent tube lights. Now, those have mostly been replaced with LEDs and energy efficient bulbs. And that's because when the building was first built at night, those barrels were lit up. Migrating flocks of birds would mistake the roof for the moon. And because birds use the moon to help navigate at night, it disrupted their flight patterns in a major way. So it's actually a really big environmental disaster. And that's why twice a year now, those birds are getting significantly during the migration season, so they don't interrupt the birds. And that brings us to the king himself, the Sears or the Willis Tower, depending on the Now, back in 1974, Sears Department Store built the tallest building in the world right here in Lincoln City. That's the Sears. Now that company left the building and the city in the early 90s, which was a bummer for us. They were a big employer. But that spire, and permanent spire is relevant with the Sears because those antennas are not considered permanent or spires, so they don't count towards that overall height. Now the Sears was the tallest building in the world for 24 years, which is actually an incredible amount of time to hold that record, especially these days. The tallest building in the world right now is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. It's over 2,700 feet tall, which makes it almost twice the height of the city. Pretty, pretty crazy tall building. All right, up to the top of the Sears Tower, through this gap here, you can see those four glass boxes sticking on the side of the tall tower. You see those? Those are observation decks called the ledge. And if you want it, you can buy a ticket. Take the elevator up to that floor, walk out to one of those glass boxes, 
look through the glass door all the way down to the street below. Now, if that sounds like fun to you, go for it. If you have a crippling fear of heights like me, don't do it. It'll be a horrible experience for you. But I have seen some photos of my friends up in those glass boxes. That's pretty cool. They do look like they're floating above the city. Now remember, those two antennas don't count towards the overall height, but I'm going to give you some context. They're each roughly 280 feet tall, which is also the same height as each of these black box buildings up here on the left. So that shows you just how massive those antennas are. And then I have one final fact about this series, and it's my favorite. And that is that two climbers have successfully climbed the entire Madden Sears Tower since it was built. The first was American climber Dan Goodman, who dressed up like Spider-Man and used suction cups to attach his hands and feet to the windows and made it all the way to the top. The video, you can see it online, it's super cool. It makes it look like Spider-Man is real and he lives in Chicago. But then, French climber Alain Robert came to Chicago and he climbed the entire height of Sears Tower with no equipment at all. Just the same to be absolutely wacky. And I was the Sears or Williams Tower. Alright, why don't we talk about some Chicago nicknames? We have a ton of them. One that you might have heard is the Second City. There's a famous comedy club here by that name. In fact, a lot of writers and performers on Saturday Night Live started off at the Second City. It's one of their unofficial training grounds. And you know the reason now why it's called the Second City, and that's because the first city burned down. So this is literally the Second City. Also the Windy City. That's a very common name. Everyone always thinks they know why it's called the Windy City. Like, oh, it's because it's windy in Chicago. No, no. It is windy here. That's not what they think it It actually comes from the World's Fair. And this is one of my favorite true stories about Chicago. So leading up to the fair, a lot of Powerful people in Chicago had to go to Congress and beg them for money and support to the fair. And in a now infamous letter, one of those politicians referred to them as those windbag blowhards from Chicago. And that is a true story of the Windy City. And I say jokes on them, we got the fair, didn't we? Another nickname we have is the city that works. And that nickname comes from the fact that we have a large working class population here. We're a blue collar city and we are proud of that reputation. But also we're the city that works because we are the city that functions. The Burnham plan made sure of that, right? We're a well-rounded city. So we have a vibrant arts and culture scene. Here on the right is the Civic Opera Building. This is the second largest opera house in the country. It's got 3,600 seats in it. Currently home to Lyric Opera of Chicago. That is a world-renowned opera company. And Chicago is also home to over 200 theater companies, ranging in size from small 40 seat storefront theaters all the way up to cultural mainstays like Goodman Theater, Festival Theater, Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Now, fun fact about your docent, I graduated in June with my master's in acting, and I am endlessly grateful to live in such a world class theater city. So, I highly recommend if you're in Chicago in the fall and later when the shows are being produced again, Go see a show, even if you don't consider yourself a theater person. There is always a show for everyone. It is a world-class, talented city full of amazing theater professionals. Now, I know something personally about a city that works because we're a city that eats. We know how to make good food, and we certainly know how to eat it. So here are a few of my favorites in Chicago. Of course, we have deep dish pizza. And then Chicago style hot dogs, Italian beef, Italian ice, popcorn, all the things you need for a well balanced breakfast. Now, there's been a long simmering debate about where you are. They make their pizzas and things, their experience, which makes them this incredible part of my stress. I don't work for them, I just work for them. And then I have one last food tip for you. And this is especially important for those of you visiting Chicago for the first time. So please, Listen closely. If you want to order a hot dog while you're here, whatever you do, do not ask for ketchup on <laughs> I have no idea why that's a rule in Chicago, but it really is. And if you ask for ketchup on your hot dog, you might be shamed by everyone around you, including the person you ordered it from. That happened to me when I moved two years ago. But if you want a Chicago style, which is my favorite way to eat a hot dog, you're going to ask them, and this is true, to drag it through the garden 
There are both pickles, peppers, relish, tomatoes, onions, mustard, and celery salt. And if you're looking for any recommendations on any of the food we just talked about, let me know after tour. I have plenty. All right, folks, we made our way back to Wolf Point, and this construction up and down the left. This is the future Salesforce Tower. It should be finished in a couple years. It's going to be taller than both the residential buildings on either side. And this is a perfect example of how the river's edge is always changing. So if you come on this tour in a year or two, you're going to see something new. Namely, Salesforce Tower, hopefully be finished by early 2023. All right, now I want to revisit a building, and I want to go back to the merchandise mart. That's this massive art deco building straight ahead on the left side of the river. This was the first Art Deco building that we talked about, but we were coming from the other direction, so look at it. But this is actually the largest commercial building in the entire world. It only has 25 floors, but that's misleading because it also has 96 acres of total office space, which is the equivalent of 73 American-sized football fields. It has 43 elevators, its own L-stop, its own firehouse, its own police station, until recently it had its own zip code. It does share a zip code these days, so it's no longer the most special gal in Chicago. But it also occupies two entire downtown city blocks, so this is a massive building, and it's really one of the historic gems of Chicago. This building has an incredibly rich history. If you're wanting to know a little bit more about Chicago in the 1920s, just look up the merchandise mark. You're going to get a lot of history on the internet there. Also, those sculpture heads on the front lined up, those are called the merchant heads. Basically, all the dead rich guys are the famous Chicago cheese thing. But my favorite part about the merchandise market is over here to the right. This glass box mounts on the side of the roof Inside that box, 34 projectors. It's an $8 billion projector system. And twice a night, every night in the summer, it's, so it's happening tonight, at 9 and 9.30, that box displays digital animated art on the walls of the merchandise market. It's called, appropriately, Art on the Market. And it's really incredible what these designers have done is that they have left out window-sized holes for their projections so that no light shines through the windows of certain tenants inside. So it only displays on the exterior walls. And a few different museums are taking turns displaying their art on art, including the Field Museum of Natural History and the Museum of Science and Industry. And these projections are incredible. I highly recommend if you are downtown at night, especially along the river walk, come to this stretch here at night or night here and you're going to get an incredible show. All right, one of my favorite views on the tour. The reason why is if you look up ahead above on the South Street Bridge, look at all those different styles of architecture, all clustered together. Such a good example of the broader Chicago style, right? All these different styles of architecture working really well together. In fact, that central tower sticking up in the middle there, the tallest one, that is the St. Regis, right? That was the first building we talked about, which was the third tallest in Chicago. So again, you can see how it's really an amazing addition to the style. All right, I'm passing under the LaSalle Street Bridge. We are passing under the LaSalle Street Bridge. This is an important north-south street in the city of Chicago. And you might notice it's a little wider than the other bridges we're passing under. And that's because in 1930, the city wanted to expand the South Street. But the problem is this great building here on the left. This is a pretty burnt out center built in 1914 as a grocery window. And look closely. On the right side of the clock tower, there are six bays of windows. But on the left, there are only five. And this is a good example of how Chicago gets things done. Because when they expanded LaSalle Street, they just chopped the end of the building off. Pretty straightforward solution now, problem. All right, up ahead on the right, this short squat concrete building number 55 near the roof. This is the only example on the tour of a short-lived architectural style from the late 1960s called brutalism. Now, it certainly does look brutal. Right? It's got those deep, dark windows, dark concrete, kind of looks like a bunker. But brutalism actually comes from the French beton bru, which means rough concrete. So that concrete is standard in brutalism. And this was a style typically found in sturdy institutional buildings like banks and courthouses. This one's a bank. And I have not yet figured out who started this. But here at Shoreline, we have affectionately nicknamed number 55 the Danny DeVito of these reasons. No shade to Danny, but he's kind of short and sandwiched between two supermodels on the other side. Now, the supermodel on the left, this black and gray building, this is the Leo Burnett. And you see that belt sticking out of the middle of the building there? That belt is at the same height as the roof of number 55. 
but that is another example of contextualism, right? Those buildings are in relationship with each other to get built. Alright, coming in, so I just asked about this building, but up ahead, a little to the right, that narrow dark green tower with the gold trim up on top, that's the Carbide Department Building. Another Art Deco building from 1929. And I love the story of this building. So this was built during Prohibition, and that was a period in American history when alcohol was illegal. So the Carbide Department was designed to look like a bottle of champagne as a protest against prohibition. So that gold leaf up on top is supposed to be gold foil wrapped right around the cork of the champagne bottle. And in fact, that's actually real 24 karat gold leaf. But before you get any bright ideas, go up there, scrape it off, make some cash. It's only half the thickness of Savannah. So you're not going to get much more. Now, some exciting news, a brand new bar has recently opened on the roof of the Carbide Department building. It's called Chateau Carbide. I have not been, but I've seen photos. It's pretty incredible. So if you're looking for a very historic place to get some drinks, get some beautiful views, again, Chateau Carbide, the roof of the Carbide Department building is now open for business. Now, we are making our way back down the main branch, and of course, Lake Michigan is, the, is at the end of the main branch. And you might be noticing, if you haven't already, you will be noticing in a moment, that the breeze is going to be getting stronger, and it's going to feel a little cooler. And that is known as the lake effect. Now, Lake Michigan, again, that's at the end of the main branch, is a gigantic body of water, and it gets incredibly cold in Chicago in winter. One of our nicknames is Shiberia, or that very reason. And so the way it works is the lake stays very cold well into the summer. So it will cool the air above the lake, right? That cold water wheel, and that's the cool breeze that comes into the city along the lake. So often if you live along the lake front, it's significantly cooler than if you live just a little further in the city. I mentioned earlier that I live in Edgewater, that's on the north side of the city, and of course that is on the lake front, it's not by the name, Edgewater. So I'm very grateful that my neighborhood is significantly cooler sometimes. Although the drawback is that in the winter, it's also colder. So it's even more for a All right, so remember the Ruby building here on the left with the clock tower on the top? One of the first buildings we talked about is that it was modeled after a Spanish cathedral. Well, our second cathedral is coming into view on the right, just a little further back, and that is Chicago Tribune Tower. Now, a lot of people think this is a church, which is a really great guess, and that's because this building was designed after a cathedral in France this time. So we call this style French Gothic Revival style architecture. Now, the Chicago Tribune is the city's largest newspaper. They lived operating in that building from 1925 to 2018, almost 100 years. But then they moved out, and it's currently being converted into high-end condos. Very expensive to live in. All right, you see Du Sommel Bridge. Remember Du Sommel? He was the first guy I mentioned on the tour, the founder of the city of Chicago, first non-indigenous permanent settler. Well, coming up on the left is the Apple Store. And I'm pointing this out because this is believed to be the original location of Du Sommel's cabin. So starting in the 17, early 1780s, when Du Sommel moved here, that's believed to be the spot where he lived. And it's important to acknowledge that Du Sommel was the first non-indigenous center. And that's because over to the right is, of course, a reminder that we are on Potawatomi. Now, the Potawatomi people were a tribe of Native Americans who lived in this area before Chicago was settled. So we like to make sure that everyone knows that that's actually where Chicago is. Chicago, oh, well, that sounds cool. Let's call ourselves back. So we are forever and always now the Stinky Onion. All right, over here to the right, you see the Swiss Hotel? It's got the name up top. You know we're competing with the sun a little bit. But there's a black box building just to its right, and coming into view along the line of black box, you're going to see a building that looks like it's covered in white fins. This is Aqua Tower. It's a high-end residence and hotel. Those fins are all balconies, and they're all uniquely shaped. The idea is that if you stand next to the Aqua at a ground level and look up at the side of the building, those balconies were designed to look like rippling waves of water. Really incredible. I highly recommend it. On that side of the river, you can make your way next to the aqua. Look up, get some really incredible photos, and it's a really gorgeous sight. Now, even though the aqua is a little tough to see, you only see the top of it. I pointed out because of the design, and that's because it was designed by none other than Chicago Land Native architect Jamie Day. If that name sounds familiar, that's because she was the first architect I mentioned on the tour. That's because 
her architecture kind of design the same features, which is on the black design. And it's that wavy building with the three towers and seven heights. So again, yet another reason why Jeannie Day is crushing the game these days. She's designed some of the most unique, beautiful buildings in the And so we've got the rippling waves of the Aqua Tower and then the wavy edges of the St. Regis. And I want you to look at the St. Regis in particular. And look at the edge of the building. And notice the way that the edge of the building is in relationship to the sky behind it. You see how it creates those waves? Well, that's Jeannie Gang's trademark. That's sort of why the Aqua Tower looks the way it does too, because she's really interested in the relationship between the edges of buildings and the sky behind. What kinds of patterns, what kind of textures can she create at the edge of the building? I also want to draw your attention to the two window, or excuse me, two floors near the top of the tall tower that we don't have any windows on the same You see those? Again, forgive me, I know we're competing with the sun. But those two floors are never going to have any windows, and they're called blow-through floors. Now, do you all remember the concrete tanks of water on 151st way? System for a similar purpose. The idea is that when wind hits the side of that tower, a lot of the wind is going to be funneled through those two open floors, and that's going to reduce the stress that wind has on the side of the tower, and it's going to cut down on the sway. So again, very similar to the concrete tanks of water, which just works a little bit. But yet another really important innovation for these things. I mentioned earlier, but again, when we get out to the basin, you're going to see how it's almost impossible to imagine what the skyline would look like without the same region, so it fits in here. All right, folks, this is the part of the tour where I'm going to brag a little bit, so bear with me. But in recent years, TripAdvisor has ranked this tour that you're on the show again as the number one tour experience, which we're very proud of the part of that. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I want you all to know we take the job very seriously. We want to have a really good time, and we also want to make sure that we teach you some things about the city that we all love so much. So, a Yelp or a TripAdvisor review where you mention my name is a really fantastic way to give us some feedback. So, if you enjoyed the tour today, again, my name is Antonio. And if you did,